Um, so we're going to go in the same uh, sort of format as we just did in the last session. My name is Astrida Namanis. I am so grateful to be here today. Uh, thank you so much to Alona and to Shriya and the PMC for um, this invitation. And I really feel in the company of some incredible doers and makers and thinkers. And I'm very grateful for all of your work. So right now we have a session um, that will feature two of those amazing doers, makers, and thinkers. Um, Chris, Chris Papai, excuse me, I, let me try that one again. I've got this one right. Chris Papayuanu, thank you very much, um, is a critical theorist, activist, and facilitator living in London. They hold a PhD from the School of Fine Art, History of Art and Cultural Studies at the University of Leeds. Chris's intellectual work is informed by the legacy of the Frankfurt School and queer feminist biopolitical thought, whilst their political organizing is informed by their lived experience of PTSD and their commitment to intergenerational mutual learning. In their most recent workshop, Hydro Feminists Against Fascism, a fluvial sound walk, they facilitated participants to explore the political and creative potential of theorizing the hydro commons through the deep listening practice of sound walking. After Chris's talk, we'll hear from Cyrus Marcus uh, Ware, and I will introduce Cyrus right before you speak. Okay, so Chris, uh, please come up. Thank you very much, Estrida, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, it's really lovely to be here. Uh, I've been sort of preparing this talk for a long time. I've been sort of intimidated. I was looking up pictures of the, the space and thinking, this is terrifying. Um, but it's really, really great to be here. Really welcoming space. Thank you to all the work, especially the invisible work that's been done behind the scenes. It's gratefully appreciated. So this is correct, apart from the fact that I won't be talking about wetlands. I want to talk about um, the border, I guess, as an epistemic category. And um, I've been, as I said earlier, while I was sort of trying to say ecofeminism and said ecofascism, instead, I've been really, I've been coming into ecofeminism through a concern about whiteness and through a concern about so-called nature, through a concern about womanhood, um, I've personally come into feminism really late and I remember thinking that the category of womanhood is what keeps me away from, from feminism. So this is a little bit of context about why I'm here today, I guess. Um, so in my talk, I wanted to ask uh, what it might mean not to decolonize ecofeminism, a move that would be misleading as well as problematic, but to shift our focus in such a manner where all ecofeminism would be decolonial. And I wish to interrogate the fact that ecofeminism has so far been very narrowly construed, and when it has been revised, it has been primarily revised from within. This is what I think of as an epistemic border category that I will touch on a little bit in the final part of the talk. In the main part of the talk, I want to sketch an overview of the key aporias we find in ecofeminist literature in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s. And this is primarily Anglophone, but again, I would say it's too easy to call it white. And then I propose that perhaps the best place to look for ecofeminist inspiration is outside ecofeminism. The many headed ecofeminisms, cultural, mystical, Marxist. Ecofeminism is rarely pluralized, and yet it is a pluralist, diverse intellectual and political project that for almost half a century now has brought together those who uphold the view that the subjugation of women is inextricably linked to the destruction of the natural world. American environmental historian Carolyn Merchant would write in her foundational 1980 monograph, The Death of Nature, that I quote, women and nature have an age-old association. American philosopher Karen J. Warren, who is one of the key figures in advancing ecofeminism philosophically, wrote of the twin and interconnected dominations of women and nature. Defending ecofeminism against its critics in the early 90s, Australian philosopher Val Plumwood urged on the importance of, I quote, a common integrated framework for the critique of both human domination and the domination of nature, 
integrating nature as fourth category of analysis into the framework of an extended feminist theory which employs a race, class, and gender analysis. Ecofeminism has a lot to answer for. One need only think of the universalizing logic that characterized the work of French writer and activist Françoise de Bonne, who proclaimed that the world's women were united in a shared lived experience of misogynist oppression. We can think of the neo-Malthusian responses to overpopulation in the 70s, which problematically linked care for the planet with abortion and reproductive rights. And as some of you will know, this is an issue that is very alive today. We can think of a broader prevalence of a gynocentric biological determinism. This often took the form of equating womanhood with motherhood, giving rise to the Mother Earth slogans that have understandably given the movement a bad name. Despite its intent to interrogate the way in which women have been historically and globally reduced to nature through their biological function, the cultural logic of ecofeminism, be it so-called cultural, spiritual, or Marxist ecofeminism, does rest, in my reading, on the perpetuation of an imaginary of nature, where nature provides the solution to the twin ills of patriarchy and environmental destruction. And therefore, the accurate allegations of essentialism apply not only to women as feminized subjects or men as masculinized subjects, perhaps overarchingly, they also apply to nature's own naturalization. And so here we see nature being used as an organic antidote to the mechanized logics of colonial capitalist patriarchal modernity. Perhaps uses the wrong word here, but it is deployed intellectually in that, in that way. And I saw that even across the, the whole spectrum, uh, even in materialist ecofeminism, which surprised me, I have to say. Ecofeminism has a lot to answer for, but it's also doing a lot of difficult work intellectually and politically. Although the binary of women and nature may appear to be operating on a single axis of analysis, their reality is one of multiple entry points. Some ecofeminists have argued that the movement had always been intersectional, not least because protest camps were places where women, rich and poor, black and white, came together in common struggle. However, I would hesitate to describe the movement as methodologically intersectional, since much ecofeminist analysis, at least in its cultural variant, relies on methodologies of analogy. And yet, listening to the stories of those scholar activists who took it upon themselves to introduce feminist concerns in male-dominated socialist spaces, while also doing so in male-dominated green movement spaces, one is struck by the multiple fronts of attack that had to be in operation. When British sociologist Mary Mellor, in her 1992 Breaking the Boundaries, calls for a feminist green socialism, She's not only calling for a kind of political system that is an anathema to the world's powers and soon to be an anathema to many people on the street, she's also asserting that the socialism must be feminist and green. Finding a place for socialism in the feminist movement is no easy task, but finding a place for feminism in eco-Marxist circles was and arguably still is even harder. Ecofeminism is a many-headed hydra, its spiritualist, its spiritualist head has been perhaps the most embarrassing and the most prominent in the popular imagination. Although earth-based spirituality and neo-pagan tendencies have flourished within ecofeminism, traditional religious faith too, through Buddhism, Hinduism, and Catholicism, has been pivotal in guiding ecofeminist writers towards an ethics of pacifism and nonviolence. In the early days of ecofeminism in the late 70s, what mattered urgently was the affirmation of the connection. The affirmation that ecocide and femicide are symptoms of the same root cause of patriarchal violence. The affirmation that without feminism, all we have is a dead planet. To some extent, early ecofeminist literature can be situated within a radical feminist context that was often misandrist. Women, by which, of course, we mean cis women, became exemplars of love and generosity, while men became hunter-predators par excellence. And here is where the vivid imagery of ecofeminist ideology emerges. 
It can be found in the analogical connection between meat eating and female bodies treated as meat, known as carnosexism, and famously argued in The Sexual Politics of Meat by vegan feminist Carol J. Adams. It's in the figure of non-consensual penetrative sex, virgin land being penetrated by a phallic colonial order. It's in the figure of fertility, in a geological imaginary where the earth has fertile soil and the female as fertile body are discussed alongside and indeed in lieu of one another. So just to summarize this part of the paper, some of the intellectual paradoxes we can identify in the eco-feminist project are gender essentialism, whether biologically or socially construed, the naturalization of nature, and a resort to nature as a fixer of both methodological and political problems, and a mode of reasoning that produces analogies rather than intersections. So this one will, is um, nicely linked with earlier paper. Uh, connecting ecofeminism is not a metaphor. Connecting this to decolonization is not a metaphor. In the famous essay, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, Yves Tuck and K. Wayne Young wrote that decolonization is not an and, it is an elsewhere. Against equality and diversity tropes that perpetuate systemic oppression, Tuck and Young sent a strong reminder that decolonization is not a bloodless process of inclusion. Ecofeminism, too, is an elsewhere. And it might, although it might seem as if it simply adds ecology to the race, class, and gender mix, it would be false to read ecofeminism as a simple equation of feminism plus ecology equals liberation. So far, I've sketched some of the limitations of ecofeminism as an intellectual project. But unlike other academic fields of inquiry, ecofeminism has never been contained within the walls of the university classroom. Ecofeminists have been writing, organizing, and practicing system change on the streets, on campsites, in the forests, and in the fields. And therein lies perhaps the greatest defense of ecofeminism against accusations of whiteness. The women who have been doing the work on the ground, literally speaking, have been doing so for decades, both in poor rural areas and in affluent urban centers, north and south. Ecofeminism is not a metaphor because it cannot be reduced to the metaphoricity many ecofeminist writers deploy. Ecofeminism's praxis and is happening among tribal, peasant, and urban communities fighting for agrarian land rights or access to uncontaminated natural resources. For an ecofeminism beyond borders. As I come towards the end of my presentation, I wish to shift our focus to the question of the border territory in terms of knowledge production. While reviewing this body of work, I've been struck by a certain insularity among ecofeminists who write and wrote both as proponents and as historians and custodians of the movement. It felt to me as if the movement wanted to defensively insulate itself against accusations so as to protect its borders. But what if we were to find traces of ecofeminism in the most unlikely places, in texts by authors who have never been associated with the movement? And with this intention in mind, I wanted to turn to the words of scholar and curator Paul B. Preciado, not to newly baptize him as an ecofeminist, but precisely because his work would remain other to the territory. I know this is a contentious claim, but I, I welcome the debate around this. Preciado's infamous address to Freudian psychoanalysts in Paris in 2019 contains many moving passages, some of which speak to the colonization of the trans body by heteropatriarchal medicalization. And I will offer here just three quotes to give you some flavor if you're not familiar with the text. The trans body is to heteronormativity what Lesbos is to Europe, a border whose form and extent can be perpetuated only through violence. The trans body is a life force. It is the inexhaustible Amazon flowing through the rainforests, impervious to dams and mining. The trans body is a colony of disciplinary institutions. And you'll see, of course, that it is through analogy and metaphor that Preciado is making his point. And in this respect, perhaps he emerges as a true ecofeminist. But Preciado's thought would never invoke nature or the natural 
to argue against environmental destruction. And this is one of my key points. In a 2000 article, scholar Elizabeth Carla Sara called for an ecofeminism that, I quote, can be considered an open, flexible, political and ethical alliance that does not invoke any shared, singular theoretical framework or epistemology. The proposition of an open, flexible, political and ethical alliance seems to me productive because it would mean that the important work of ecofeminism isn't obscured by efforts to do so in its name. Shall we then let a thousand ecofeminisms bloom? Shall we pluralize what is rarely pluralized? If we are to salvage an anti capitalist ecofeminism for the present, if we are to salvage its commitment to the unity of theory and praxis through scholarship that fosters activism and vice versa, its intersectional ambitions, despite its metaphoricity, it's doing the difficult work in male-dominated camps where feminism is dismissed as identity political. We need to reconfigure ecofeminism not only in multiple terms, but also in decentralized, decolonial terms. Dangerously and devastatingly, it is not a given that the political project of ecofeminism is one that would stand up against the rising tide of ecofascism in solidarity with the displaced. Just as the ecofeminist movement does not have its origins in one single source, Françoise Dobon's If Feminism or Death never played the role of a Bible, so the movement needn't have one single endpoint. While the historicist situating of ecofeminism within linear feminist historiography is significant, ecofeminism's true historical and geopolitical place is here and in the elsewhere. Thank you so much, Chris. And um, I will now uh, invite um, Cyrus Marcus Ware to join us at the front. Um, I'm going to read out this full bio because it's amazing. Is, um, Cyrus is a Vanier scholar, visual artist, activist, curator, and educator. Cyrus is an assistant professor at the School of the Arts, uh, McMaster University, my hometown. I have to say. <laughs> Using painting, installation, and performance, Cyrus works with and explores social justice frameworks in black activist culture. His work has been shown widely, including solo shows at Grunt Gallery in 2018, um, the title of which was uh, 2068, Touch Change, and Will Abale Art Projects in 2021, called Irresistible Revolutions. His work has been featured as part of the inaugural Toronto Biennale of Art in 2019 in conjunction with Ryerson Image Centre with a work called Antarctica and Ancestors, Do You Read Us? Dispatches from the Future, as well as for the Beltway Safety and Public Spaces Initiative in 2020, a work called Radical Love. Cyrus has participated in group shows at the Never Apart in Montreal, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the University of Lethbridge Art Gallery, the Art Gallery of York University, Art Gallery of Windsor, and as part of the curated content at Nuit Blanche 2017 with a work called The Stolen People Won't Back Down. His performance works have been part of festivals across Canada, including at Cripping the Stage, Harbourfront Centre 2016 and 2019, Complex Social Change, University of Lethbridge Art Gallery 2015, and Decolonizing and Decriminalizing Trans Genres at University of Winnipeg 2015. Cyrus is part of the PDA, uh, Performance Disability Art Collective, and co-programmed Crip Your World, an intergalactic queer POC sick and disabled extravaganza as part of Mayworks 2014. Recent curatorial projects include That's So Gay at the Gladstone Hotel, Repurpose at Robert McLaughlin, and the Church Street Mural Project at Church Wesley Village in 2013. Cyrus is also co-curator of The Cycle, a two-year disability arts performance initiative of the National Arts Center. So that's like, whoa, amazing. Um, and we're only gonna get to hear a little bit of it today. So I hope it was okay that I indulged you all with that very long um, bio. So welcome very much. And then we'll take questions to both Chris and Cyrus after the talk.
Thank you so much, everyone. I'll take my mask off. Um, so my name is Cyrus Marcus Ware, and I'm an artist and an activist and a scholar. And I'm really going to focus on the resist part of our conference today and really dive into some activist moments and organizing, um, and particularly how it relates to art and colonialism and climate. Uh, I've been organizing for about 26 years in Northern Turtle Island, organizing around climate justice, black liberation, uh, queer and trans justice, and disability justice. And it's been uh, an incredible uh, time to be involved in activism and organizing. So one of the things that's really interesting to me is this idea of systems change. And I've been studying systems change and systems theory and teaching about it at the Banff Center for Art and Creativity in Banff, Alberta. And one of the things that we study is this, uh, the panarchy cycle or the panarchy uh, loop, sometimes it's called, and it looks like this. Uh, and it's an adaptive change cycle. It's a way of understanding how systems change. And I'm really interested in, in this as an activist uh, and as an organizer. And it looks like that direction. So the way that this model works, it's a way of understanding how all systems, living systems, the social systems that we find ourselves in, the social structures that are taking place in our organizations and in our communities go through life cycles. They all go through a period of growth and expansion and they all go through periods of collapse and reorganization, right? And so this is something that happens over and over again. We see in this uh, illustration, I tried to use a forest metaphor, but um, we have uh, the, the cycle, uh, you know, uh, uh, in this case, a forest system going from uh, tiny saplings, uh, growing and expanding to a much larger forest that maybe has a, a wide and large enough canopy that it is now potentially using up all of the, the majority of the resources that are coming from the sun and from the water. So the uh, plants at the bottom are affected. Uh, and what, what usually happens in uh, traditionally managed forest ecosystems where there's indigenous practices uh, allowed, uh, of course, there would be a natural forest fire that would clear out some of that uh, overgrowth and allow for light and for things to come through to the bottom uh, forest floor. Um, of course, what we know is that a lot of forests aren't able to be practiced or managed in indigenous ways. And through colonial forest management, often uh, forest fire is uh, uncontrolled uh, and takes over. But in this model, we can imagine a controlled forest fire that allows for a release of resources and allows for the germination of new ideas, new seeds, new foliage at the forest floor. And so this model, this cycle of adaptive change is something that we can study in order to understand where we are in any given moment in our social world. And this is really used, useful for us as activists. And I'm speaking here not only as an organizer who's been on the ground, who's watched how the system has grown, expanded, collapsed, and reorganized over and over again. But I'm saying this as an activist scholar, and I'm thinking here of Chinire Apara and Mona Ozakara Ray's theory of activist scholarship and how we can bring activism into our uh, academic world in order to understand what's happening in the social world. So I spent all of January 2020 in Australia, and I was doing a residency there through the Grunt Gallery and other sites out in Vancouver, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Territory, and the entire continent was on fire. Like the entire continent was on fire. And this was six months uh, after the Amazon rainforest was on fire throughout the summer of 2019. And in January of 2020, we were there in Sydney wearing masks, not because of COVID, because that hadn't hit yet, but because of the smoke from the forest fires. Uh, the, a lot of, uh, I should mention, a lot of the areas in Australia where indigenous forest practice management had been allowed to continue, uh, the fires weren't widespread. But in areas where where there were, it was colonially managed, there was widespread uh, devastation. Well, this photograph is actually a February 2020 uh, in Australia. And immediately you can see in the charred ashes of the forest, new opportunistic growth uh, growing up in the ashes of the old. And this is what we talk about in that release phase of the panarchy loop is that there's a release of resources that allows for the germination of new plants. And of course, in terms of activism, new ideas. So a lot of what we're doing as organizers and activists is this. We are the new opportunistic growth that is growing up in the ashes of the old. 
In 2020, to continue that story, of course, I came back from Australia ready to take on the world, and uh, the world had other plans. Of course, we went into an immediate uh, lockdown, and the cycle, uh, our system, was already on a uh, sort of a dangerous tipping point, and we saw it fall into a state of collapse. Uh, by May of 2020, I'm based in, in Canada and Northern Turtle Island. By May of 2020 in North America, they were putting you know millions of dollars a day into the stock market to keep it propped up because it threatened to collapse, because people weren't buying anything, people weren't going out. We saw this, this turn, so there was already uh, a collapse happening because of climate change, and then of course with the economic shutdown that happened and because of everybody being locked down, we saw a, a, a turn towards collapse. And it was in this moment that we saw the expansion of some incredible new ideas. And of course, what I'm talking about here is abolition. Uh, Octavia Butler, I'm going to talk a lot about speculative uh, fiction today. Octavia Butler, a black speculative fiction author, uh, wrote a lot about this moment. She wrote in particular in these books, Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, she wrote about the year 2024. And she wrote about a time when the system was going through a period of collapse. And she said, in the future, when this happens, the one thing that will be constant is change. And so she said, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. And she later says, the only lasting truth is change. Therefore, touch change. That we should be involved in touching and shaping what change looks like and how it manifests in our society. So I've been organizing with Black Lives Matter. I'm co-founder of Black Lives Matter Canada. And in 2020, another thing happened, and that was the continuation of the Black Death Spectacle, the violation of Black life by policing and the carceral system. In May of 2020, we had the killing of George Floyd, which resulted in global widespread protests and organizing in Tagarando, in Toronto, the city that I'm in. Regis Korczynski Paquette, an Afro-Indigenous woman, was pushed from her balcony by Toronto Police Services, and she died. And there was a continued stream of deaths that summer. Jacob Blake was shot seven times in the back. Breonna Taylor was shot in her bed, and so on, and so on, and so on. And people started saying, maybe the police aren't doing what we think they do. Maybe they're not keeping us safer or more secure in the ways that we think. And we started seeing people turn towards this idea of defunding the police and reinvesting in other things, community centers, parks, libraries, schools, uh, ed you know, educational opportunities for young people, nature, the environment, you know, all sorts of other things that we could reinvest if we weren't spending all of our money on bloated police salaries. And so what we did was we got together... Um, in June of 2020, uh, we came to police headquarters with 80 contemporary artists, and we did an action. Um, and I'm going to show you what that action looked like. We uh, took, it was June, uh, the month of June, so it was uh, uh, Queer and Trans Pride Month, uh, and it was also Juneteenth, which is this day that commemorates the adoption of the Emancipation Proclamation by Texas, which had been signed months earlier, but that Texas resisted adopting because they were so pro slavery. So the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation is commemorated on June 16th, and so on June 16th at 8 a.m., we marched out to in front of police headquarters picking the queerest pink color that we could find, and we painted a message to our communities, and in particular to the many police officers who came out and watched us do this action. So this is what we created. And there's sound. It's hard to listen, but listen, cause it's much harder living it than listening to the hardships. So the heart's condition to condition the air when the air that conditions keep cool with the more tears. Sometimes it clear the vision, not what I see. Been a long time coming to drop, running, rocking, reaching new peaks so the youngest can finally summit. Climbing high above and flying from it up to the skies and overstanding the corruption and deconstructing the lies. I've seen this country decline, try to keep discussions confined, hide the underside over a 
extract and try to undermine. Damn, but I still believe in the truth. With a wrist and MC in the booth or a PhD in the suit. Yo, when we yell it, bro, test. Tell them the feeling is peaceful. We profess, we pro. Testify to the will of the people. Tell them what they must know. Turn it up loud when we bust flows. Not in hush tones. Speaking up, let the trust grow. Now you don't gotta tell me how you feel. Cause I can see it in your eyes. You don't gotta tell me the pain is real. So this is what it looked like. Uh, it was a 7,200 square foot mural um, that was again in this very vibrant uh, pink color, um, and it and it and it was on top of that mural that we outlined uh, 50 demands, including an immediate 50% reduction of police budgets to directly reinvest in our communities uh, in ways that we need it. And why uh, this? Why on Juneteenth? Why in that moment? We were witnessing an unprecedented unprecedented war on black life. And this is something that Tiffany Lethepo King, Dr. Uh, Tiffany King has talked about as the fungibility of black bodies, the ways that our bodies have been treated as replaceable as seeds, as um, uh, fungible as seeds that you would cast into a field. It doesn't matter if they all grow because you have more than enough seeds. We are replaceable. And it was because of this replaceability, we were used to literally terraform the land to transform the conditions to displace indigenous people, right? And so policing was a huge part of that. The slave catcher patrols became the police system and it continued all through the, the, the horrible summer of 2020 and all of the deaths that we saw. So back to speculative fiction. I mentioned Octavia Butler in the beginning. You might have seen in when I was sketching on the road, I actually have the words touch, change, tattooed on my arms to remind me forever of her words. But we know that speculative fiction is a way of dreaming forward into the future. Walida and Marisha writing in the book Octavia's Brood, which is all writing inspired by Octavia Butler, she said that all activism was speculative fiction because we were daring to dream that another world was possible. Right? So we get involved in organizing and activism, she said, why not turn to speculative fiction as part of your activism? Because it's a way of, as Adrienne Marie Brown says, practicing the future. And so from that mural, I want to take you forward. Uh, that was in 2020. A lot has happened since 2020, including an increase in criminalization of queer and trans people, the continued war on black life, and of course now terrible issues with climate. I was outside in just this uh, earlier today, it shouldn't be this warm in December. So we're, we're witnessing quite a, a, a tremendous moment. So as mentioned, I did a project in 2019 for the Toronto Biennial of Art and it was uh, based on this idea of speculative fiction and practicing the future. And it presupposed this idea, what would happen if we had a message or were able to communicate with our great-grandchildren. And so thinking generations in the future, and this is something that uh, I've learned a lot about from Indigenous colleagues and, and friends uh, back in Turtle Island, this idea of thinking seven generations forward. So in this project, I used uh, speculative fiction as a way of imagining a different kind of future, drawing on activist moments. And so set in the year 2072, our great-grandchildren figure out a way using old technology technology to patch through different time zones. And so you see found footage showing you different activist moments. And they land in 2019 and they give us a message of what they think we need to do. Everyone in this video was queer or trans or non-binary or two-spirit. Everyone in this video is black, indigenous, or Afro-indigenous. And this, there's a line in the video where they say, black people survive because of you. And we know that because of the Combahee River Collective statement in 1977, if black people have survived, everyone and everything has survived. If you make the world safer for those who are most marginalized, you are necessarily making the world safer for everyone else. So we created this world where uh, that's Jazz Fray J, Raven Wings, Gloria Swain, Tegan, um, Davis, uh, Rodney DeVerlis, uh, all actors and dancers and performers. And this is Ancestors Do You Read Us, Dispatches from the Future. Do you read me? Do you read me? Do you read us? Can you copy? Can you read us? Can you copy? Do you read us? Whoa, can you read me? We are your great grandchildren. And we have a message for you. 
culture. This scene is really gone crazy out here right now. Do you read us? Do you read us? Can you copy? We have a message for you from 2072. We are your great grandchildren. We are your great grandchildren. We have a message for you. The first thing we want. The first to say thing we want to say is that we love you. Is that we love you. It was because of you that we survived three generations past what was predicted. It was because of you that we were able to stop this ravage of the earth, our mother. We were able to stop this ravage of the earth. The atomic age has moved forward at such a pace. The language of atomic warfare. The atomic age has moved forward at such a pace. The language of atomic warfare. Do you read us? Can you copy? Do you read me? Can you copy? The second thing is, we want to warn you. We want to warn you. You told us how to build this technology to contact you, to act, to rebel, to take this earth back from the capitalists. You told us how to create this technology to contact you. So we can tell you to act. To rebel. Because one woman said, I have had enough. To take back the earth. To take back the earth from the capitalists. To find self-determination and freedom. Black people survive Black because, people of you. Survive. because of you. It's not too late. We want to thank you, ancestors. We love you. We love you, ancestors. We thank you. Thank you, ancestors. And transmission. And transmission. So that video is a message to us from 2072. I wish they had told us how to overthrow capitalism, but I suppose that's our work set out for us. So these two videos are offerings of ways of bringing art and activism together to address climate, to address trans justice and gender justice, and to push for the kinds of changes that result would result in the kind of future that we see them living, a future where it is accessible, where disabled, deaf, and mad people have what they need to survive, a future where black life is inherently valuable, a future where we've gotten rid of borders and where indigenous resurgence and land back has happened, and a future where justice is available for all people. So that is the future I'm fighting for. I'm really interested in the resist. And of course, part of resisting is persisting despite what's happened. So since 2020, we've seen a pendulum swing to the right. We've seen a lot of conservatism come in. We know that this is because our movement was so successful in 2020 in changing ideas. Literally, Cosmopolitan magazine was writing about ab abolition in the year 2020. Don't get your advice about abolition from Cosmo, but it's quite an amazing thing that even Cosmo was writing about it. And it's because of how, as, as Asada Shakur reminds us, we will win. It is because of the fact that we are moving in the direction that we need to go to to get towards a free future that the right is trying desperately to regain, regain some ground. So this is a moment for hope, this is a moment for possibility, and this is a moment for freer futures. Thank you. Wow. What an amazing pairing, you know? Like, 
how how great and and you know I don't know maybe some of you are wondering you know what do those two talks have to do with each other and I'm just thinking Chris you know of your comments sometimes we need to look for ecofeminism not an ecofeminism do you know what I mean so um, thank you both for this really wonderful set of provocations okay enough of me. Uh, questions, please, for either Chris or Cyrus or both. It would be lovely to have some questions that maybe can be um, passed to both of them to reflect on or comment on. But um, if you have one for either, that's also great. I was really interested in kind of the, I think, parallels that were brought up with the idea of spec fit spec lit and also um what was brought up about elsewheres because i do some work on kind of art and utopianism and it within that we kind of look at how utopianism is a constantly moving set of elsewheres it's not anything you can actually gain and that comes up a lot in spec lit as well i think so i wondered whether both of you either of you could talk about you think the values of utopianism in your work or the role it's played and how it actually is a is a usable practice maybe there's a lot to say. Yes. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about prefigurative politics, obviously. Um, and um, one of the things that I think we can take away from, and I'm also connected, I was thinking a lot about the queer taxonomies that was brought up earlier. I think one of the reasons why I think we need to be very mindful of linear historicism and developmental kind of thinking. So how do we hold, how do we say, okay, these writings, you know, they're very 70s as it were. You know, how do we do that work of situating while also holding on to something that is intergenerational in the way that the last video shows really, really beautifully. And that, so, prefigurative politics really is very much the idea that we're not waiting for the revolution to come but we are doing the work of undoing now. Um, and so I, I don't write about utopia, but I, th I think for me this elsewhere is precisely what you're articulating with the word utopia. And it's absolutely necessary to think about that in relation to the nation state, because I don't think utopia could ever be co-opted. Um, and it shouldn't be in the way that queerness is. And, you know, homo-nationalism and queerness are distinct, you know? So this is how I see it. Queer, queerness is always utopian. Yeah, I definitely have thought a lot about, you know, Octavia Butler, so much of her work and her writing, it really inspires us to dream into different kinds of futures. And her work isn't necessarily utopic. I mean, Parable of the Sower, the two books I showed, so I mean, not to give it away for anyone who hasn't read it, but some pretty rough stuff happens in that book. I won't even get started on what happens when they get to Acorn, the community that they build. So it's not always through utopia necessarily that we we have to find freedom that you know we are living very much in a dystopic timeline and that one of the effects of that is the lack or the loss of possibility uh, and in systems change in systems theory one of the things that we talk about is this idea of future possible this idea of being able to prefigure to being able to to live as if we're already there being able to dream into a future that uh, we don't yet have a clear articulation this is why I love talking to artists about speculative fiction because sometimes they're literally painting a picture of what it can look like and for those of us who have a bit more trouble just imagining beyond the dystopic uh, you know artists can really give us a window into what might be possible uh, thank you can I follow up on that question but and not to put you on the spot but to uh, in relation to the exhibition that this whole conference is connected to because the question of a fragment of the past <laughs> that might still contain a kind of uh, a, a kernel <laughs> of possibility is kind of a fundamental dynamic of of art history <laughs> or like that there's some kind of potential in an art object that transcends the time in which it's made and that these objects move through time like they remain from the past and so building on that I will come to a question <laughs> um like how, did you have reflections on on either of you have any reflections on on the exhibition 
and how, how that might work within it. Well, I have to confess, I have to still see the exhibition because I was, I, anyway, but I am going to see it after. But one thing I will say is that, you know, for me, I'm very interested in these ideas, the idea of the archive and the idea of putting our hands on the archive, the idea of creating living archives, the idea of uh, referencing the past in a way that is relevant to the present and potentially to the future. In Ancestors Do You Read Us, you see a lot of found footage. And so I played with that idea a lot. What can we learn by looking at clips of Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera telling everyone, y'all better quiet down? What can we learn from seeing Rufus Thomas and others at the Black Woodstock, Wattstack, they called it, in Watts in California in 1970? What can we learn from Eisenhower giving his speech about nuclear power being the advent of everything great? What can we learn by looking back at those moments? I'm also thinking a lot about this video work, you know, as a bit of a time capsule because it's also from a particular moment. It was pre pandemic. I wrote a short story following up that video that was about uh, our ancestors contacting us again and saying, there's a reason why we didn't tell you about the pandemic. We needed you to believe that it was possible to move beyond uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, but anyways, it was just a, a way of writing into that. Um, so That's right. I just got the chills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris, did you want to respond to that as well? Or? Yeah, I've been, I've been thinking about how to untangle that because, yeah, um, I agree with you about, ov obviously, one of the reasons why we, one of the ways in which we can think about art is that it transcends the particular moment, otherwise it would be merely a historical document, right? Um, and the, ex the temporality of the exhibition and the temporality of the artwork, I would think of as quite separate. Uh, and in terms of temporalities of exhibition, I think it's, because I'm not a museum curator, I'm I'm aware that I think it's quite easy to say, well, you know, it's a, it's a museum exhibition, therefore it's kind of bad because it's within the walls of the institution and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't had the chance to see, to see the exhibition yet. I, I am negatively predisposed just because I'm negatively predisposed towards ecofeminism. Uh, but, you know, I'm waiting to be surprised. Uh, and but what I very much hope is that this exhibition will actually create different ways of of talking about climate and gender. And uh, yeah, I very much hope that people on the ground, climate activists on the ground in the UK, get involved with. I don't I don't know because I'm not really part of those movements. My work's within the trade union world. Um, um, I have done a little bit of work in in green spaces, but I wouldn't say they're my spaces. But uh, I generally think this is. You know, it it's a it's a it's a public uh, exhibition in a in a in a big institution, and that that to me is is of significant political value, even though you know, even though it might seem that it's you know, in a quote unquote conservative context. This mm -hmm. doesn't answer your question, but I, again, just to just to say. I would distinguish between the temporality of the exhibition and the temporality of the artwork. In relation to the temporality of the artwork, I don't know, we probably don't have time. We can have a chat about this afterwards. I'm, I was talking a little bit about analogy and how about analogy and metaphor are a bad thing. They're obviously not a bad thing because otherwise we wouldn't have art, we wouldn't have representation. Uh, but it's, it's really important to think about the relationship between the ways we produce knowledge um, and again, I think that connects to the to the whole conversation about the was it the senses the the senses panel. Um, yeah, this is meandering, but I think it's time for wine. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there one final quick question, or are you too thirsty? <laughs> there is one at the front, and we'll just maybe keep a responses. A little bit short, but we have time to speak together afterwards, which and tomorrow, if hopefully you come back. So. Really great openings here. Yeah, just uh, when that canopy thickens, how do you um, how do you uh, nourish yourself? Mm. Say it again. When that what? When that canopy thickens, how do you nourish yourself? That's such an important question, and I hope that if there's one thing that we can take from this conference is strategies for how to take care of each other and for how to take care of ourselves and uh, and how to rest and how to do that. And I think that 
you know, when that canopy thickens, um, you know, one of the things that we can do is we can turn to the underbrush, we can go into the underground and we can find community and home there. And in, res and in the sort of resistance, the weeds, you know, I'd rather be with the weeds than with the roses. And uh, I think that there's a lot of magic in that. I nourish myself through um, a dance form that's called contact improvisation, um, which I think has utopian potentials, and I'm going to be writing about this very soon. Um, but I think what I want to address is, I don't know if you identify as disabled, but I, I went through, I have experienced ableism in organizing a lot, and it's a really, really big issue. So I think ecofeminism should really include some kind of cripping of ideas as well. And uh, we shouldn't have to come out as disabled for the movement to be sustainable. Thank you. That is a great way to wrap up today.